Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Father, bless your word to us this evening. We're grateful, Lord, for the chance to come and to study it and to hear from you, Lord. That's really what we're here to do. We're here to listen to you and to the voice of your spirit as it speaks so clearly, so wonderfully through your word. So do this for us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in a verse-by-verse study through the book of Acts. And in a broad picture, the book of Acts explains God's movement in the first generation of Christians. It doesn't tell us everything that God did in that first generation. No, not by any means. There's lots that God did among that first generation of Christians that is not included in the book of Acts. But basically, it explains to us how the gospel went all the way from Jerusalem all the way to Rome and throughout the Roman Empire. And God used a lot of remarkable people to affect the spread of the gospel that way. In the opening chapters of the book of Acts, Jesus ascends into heaven, but before he ascended into heaven, he commanded his disciples that they should do something that we commonly call the Great Commission, right? That they should go forth into all the world, into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, and that they should make disciples of all the nations. Well, the disciples took that seriously, but in these opening chapters of the book of Acts, they're just in Jerusalem. Having been filled with the Holy Spirit in a remarkable way on the day of Pentecost, the church got started and converts started coming in by the thousands, not by the hundreds. And in the early days of this tremendously prospering work, these Jewish believers, because let's remind ourselves of something, right? At this point, the makeup of the church is entirely Jewish. There are no Gentile believers coming into the church as of yet. That'll happen later. But as of now, it's all in Jerusalem, and it is all among uh, people from a Jewish background. Well, as that work is thriving, it's raising questions from the religious authorities. And in a few places already in the book of Acts, we've seen this conflict between the religious authorities and the leaders of the early church. Just last week, we saw how the religious authorities arrested all all of the apostles and put them in jail. And then we saw also last week how there was this angelic jailbreak, right, where God sent an angel to just go and open up that prison door and to let them out. Miraculously, they were freed, but they weren't freed so that they could run for the hills. They weren't freed so that they could save their own skins. They were freed so that they could go out and preach the gospel. And they did it immediately, again, putting themselves at risk So they were arrested again and brought before the council. That's where we come to verse 27 of Acts chapter 5. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? That's the name of Jesus, by the way. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. I just want you to picture this scene in your mind for a few moments. Here you have a council of leading religious men among the Jewish people of that day. There they are in Jerusalem in their fancy uh, council hall. Think of something like a congress or a parliament, something official, something that just sort of uh, uh, smacks of authority and prestige. It's sort of meant to intimidate somebody, right? When you walk into a courtroom, I don't know, maybe some of you have more familiarity with courtrooms than I do. I've had my share of traffic tickets where I've had to go and answer before a judge. Um, But you you go in there and the whole scene is meant to intimidate you, right? Is the judge on your level? No, he's on like a pedestal above you, right? Does the judge dress like you do? No, he has got a special robe on. They give him a little hammer to beat things on his table and all sorts of things. I, I mean, the whole scenario is there to make you impressed with the judge and with the law. Well, that same kind of scenario, that same kind of thing that's supposed to make you kind of afraid, that's what the apostles were facing. There they were, 12 of them, standing before this council. And this attempt to intimidate the apostles with all the trappings of the council's institutional authority, it didn't work. I picture in my mind, and I hope I'm not reading too much in the text, I picture in my mind the apostles unbothered by this. And why would they be bothered? I mean, after all, If you just had a miraculous, angelic deliverance from jail, what would a human court 
bother you with, right? I've got God, I've got the angels on my side. We respect you, Mr. High Priest, but we're not afraid of you. We're, we're fearing God. I just want you to think about it, something else before I talk about what the high priest said in these verses. I want you to think, as you're picturing in your mind's eye this, this august council set before the apostles right there, I want you to think of somebody who was probably there. There was probably a hot-shot young leader among the Jewish people at that time, a guy who had been trained up under some of the most prominent rabbis of the day, a man with impeccable credentials, a, a man who was a rising star in the world of Judaism at that time, and his name was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Now, you probably know this guy, but you probably know him under his Roman name. Because as was customary in that day, Saul of Tarsus had a Jewish name, Saul, but he also had a name that he was known by in the Roman world, in the Greek-speaking world. And that name was Paul. This man, Paul, who later became an apostle of the early church and the greatest missionary and by far the dominating figure of the book of Acts from about the middle on, I believe that Paul was right there in that council listening to the apostles probably angry with everybody else, wondering why these guys had the, had the guts to go out and be preaching the name of Jesus out on the Temple Mount. Now, why do I believe that Paul was a member of this council? Well, a little bit later on in the book of Acts, when we first meet Paul, or should I say Saul of Tarsus, when we meet this man, Saul of Tarsus, he's already a prominent man having a leadership position among the Jews. And if he was, then it's appropriate that he'd be a member of the council. But I have an even better idea behind that. The better idea is simply this. In Acts chapter 26, verse 10, Saul, remembering his life before Christ, he begins to tell them what kind of man he was and how he persecuted the Christians. And he uses a very interesting phrase in Acts 26, 10. He says this, I cast my vote against them. Now, in what possible scenario would Saul of Tarsus have the opportunity to cast a vote against the early Christians if it was not in that council, the Sanhedrin, upon which the apostles stood before right now? So I think that Saul of Tarsus is there. And with great intensity, he's following the procedures because later on, in just a few chapters, you're going to see this man, Saul of Tarsus, becomes the most prominent persecutor of this first generation of Christians. Now, let's take a look at what the high priest said, right? We'll start again in verse 27. And when they had brought them and set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Now, you know, I don't think of the apostles being smart, Alex. I kind of can be sometimes, and so I always think of a smart alecky answer to things all the time. I, it's kind of funny that the high priest did forbid... Peter and John from speaking in the name of Jesus. But that's only two of the twelve, right? I could just imagine ten of the twelve apostles saying, well, you didn't say anything to us. You told them not to do it, but not us. I guess we get a free pass. No, no, no. I mean, they knew that they weren't supposed to do this. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Now, by the way, when the high priest told Peter and John no longer to preach in the name of Jesus, what did Peter and John tell them? They said to them very plainly, sorry, Mr. High Priest, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep doing this because we are convinced that this is what God wants us to do, and we know that we're supposed to obey God before we obey man. Respecting your authority, but we have to obey God first. Well, that's what they plainly told them. He goes on here, if you notice in verse 28, the high priest also says, and look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine." I'll tell you again, I, in the movie that runs in my head, there's the 12 apostles there, and they're delighted at this statement of the high priest. To them, it's a stamp of approval. What, do you think we're doing so good that we've actually filled all of Jerusalem with this doctrine? That's exactly what we're trying to do. I see a great big smile coming upon their faces as the high priest says this. Yes, that's just what we wanted to do. And then he says, you filled Jerusalem with this doctrine and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now there's two things I want you to see in this phrase at the end of verse 28 where he says that you intend to bring this man's blood on us. First of all, please notice this. How hard the high priest works 
to avoid saying the name of Jesus. Right, did you see it in verse uh, 20, uh, no, 28? First he says, don't teach in this name. What name is he talking about? The name of Jesus. But he won't say the name of Jesus. And then he says, this man's blood on us. But he won't say the blood of Jesus. The high priest seems afraid to even say the name of Jesus. Listen, I, I think it's a delightful thing for people to say the name of Jesus. Oh, no, I don't mean as part of a swear word, right? That's, that's terrible. People should, and I just say in all kindness to you, if you swear and use the name of Jesus in that way, that's disrespectful, and you should stop that. But, but other ways that you should say the name of Jesus, you should be saying the name of Jesus all the time. And haven't you uh, uh, encountered uh, people who have yet to believe sometimes? And they seem afraid to say the name of Jesus. They, they just don't want to deal with Jesus, which is what they should do. You know, this is the compelling truth that everybody has to deal with, that the high priest, you and I, those who have yet to believe, what are you going to do with Jesus? Uh, he is the compelling figure. Oh, no, I, I know you want to make it all about speculative theological questions. You know, uh, here's the big one, you know, could God make a rock so big that he couldn't lift it? Aha, that's the big question. You know, come on. Or, or you want to make it all about church, you know? Yeah, it's those Christians, or, or the church is too involved in politics, or this and that. You want to go on and on about debates, and we could have those conversations if you wanted to. But let's just sweep all of that away for a minute and say, what about Jesus? Why are you rejecting Jesus? You want to act like you're confused about theology? Fine. You, you, you want to say you, you, you're sore at the church? Okay, great. But what about Jesus? You need to put the focus on Jesus again and again and again when you're telling people about the gospel. Because listen, when we invite people to Jesus, we're not primarily asking them to join some club. We're not primarily, hey, become a part of the Christian club, so to speak. No, 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 no. We're telling them to come to Jesus, right? Interact with him. Look to him. He is your salvation. Deal with Jesus. So that's a big deal, how the high priest seemed to want to avoid saying the name. I also think it's interesting how he protested that Peter and the other apostles seemed to want to bring this man's blood on us. Now, what the high priest meant by that is, you're trying to hold us guilty for the blood of Jesus, for the death of Jesus on the cross. And was it true? Well, yes, it was true in a sense. Peter has preached it several times. He looked at the Jewish people of his day, and very plainly he said, you guys sent him to the cross. Now, he doesn't mean that in a moment, that the Jewish people exclusively were responsible for the death of Jesus. In sort of a master stroke of God's providential plan, God allowed it to be so that both Jew and Gentile had an equal role in sending Jesus to the cross so that nobody could only blame the Gentile or nobody could only blame the Jew. It was both of them together. The, the, the Jewish delivered them over to the Roman authorities and either one of them could have let Jesus go, but both of them participated in his execution on the cross. So while we don't want to say that the Jewish people were exclusively guilty of sending Jesus to that cross in that generation, certainly they had their share of guilt in the matter. By the way, and if I could say, theologically speaking, as do I have my share of guilt in the matter. And if I could be so bold to say it, as do you have your share of guilt in the matter. Because Jesus went to the cross not as a victim of circumstances, not as the victim of a bad justice system or cruel fate. He went there out of a decided choice to pay for sins. And whose sins was it that he went to the cross for? It was my sins, it was your sins. It was our sins that sent him to the cross. But the Jewish leaders, the high priest specifically, he feels, hey, don't put his death on me. It's funny because there's a sense in which Peter is thinking, I'm imagining here, oh, Mr. High Priest, I want to put his death on you. Not in the sense of blaming you exclusively for his death. No, no. I want to put his death on you in the fact that he would pay for your sins, that you would recognize that he died in your place, that he is your salvation, that, that as he hung on the cross, it was as a substitutionary sacrifice, and all the sin, all the guilt, 
all the shame that your sin deserved, it was judged in Jesus on the cross. I want to bring that death upon you, not in the sense of condemning you with its guilt, but with freeing you with the power of its identification. So here they make this very bold declaration. You could just sense the anger and the fury of the high priest, right? But look at the response of Peter and the other apostles, starting now at verse 29, where we read. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to those things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. What a dramatic statement Peter and the other apostles made right here. They're not intimidated at all. This was a testimony, first of all, of great boldness. Here's Peter looking at the high priest in the eye. And the high priest have told him, I don't want you to teach any more in the name of Jesus. And you know what Peter said to him? I'll bring it down to one phrase. No. No, with all due respect, Mr. High Priest, I'm going to keep teaching in the name of Jesus. It's not because I disrespect you. It's not because I want to be unsubmitted to your office. No. I'm going to do it because God has given me a higher command, a command that goes even higher than your authority as high priest over Israel. You know, it's very interesting, this bold stand that they took for the sake of the gospel. Their response to the council here was not a defense. It wasn't even an explanation. It wasn't a, a plea for mercy, but rather it was a simple declaration of action. No, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. You know, you should understand that in general, the New Testament teaches that we should submit to those in authority. Now, I suppose I'm not supposed to say that, and you're especially not to say that to a younger generation that's been raised in a culture of complete autonomy, that, that the highest value for your own life is to do whatever you want to do. Has that really been hammered into our generation in the last, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years? That this is the highest goal of humanity, this is the greatest aspiration of humanity, that you should do whatever you want to do. And the only authority in your life is what you choose for yourself. You know, that, that's not biblical thinking. The Bible says that there are legitimate institutions of authority in the world. That there's an order of authority in the family. That it's appropriate, maybe I shouldn't say this around some young men, I'll just say it because the Bible says it, it's appropriate for children to submit to their parents. It's appropriate for uh, there to be an order of submission in the home, right, between husbands and wives. It's appropriate that there's an order of submission in the workplace where employees submit to their employers. It's appropriate that there be an order of authority in the community where the citizens submit to the police. This is God's order of authority, and we should respect it. We should submit to the God-ordained authorities that are placed. But, but, and this is a huge but, God also wants us to know that a submission on a human level is never absolute. Never. Because always, and I'll say it again, always, we are commanded to obey God before man. Therefore, I've actually had this instance happen once or twice. Your husband fills out the tax return, and you know he's lying. You know he's robbing from the government. And he hands the pen to the wife, and he says, sign it. The Bible says you should submit to me. She has every right in the world to say, God tells me not to lie, and his command's greater than yours. Maybe I shouldn't have given that example. I don't know. How about this one? Your employer tells you to do something illegal or unethical. You know that you would be sinning against God for you to obey your boss or your supervisor. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. My obedience to God is more important than my obedience to man. You're supposed to do it respectfully. 
Don't slap your employer in the face, but do it respectfully, but obey God instead of man. Or how about this one? There, are, there is the possibility in our culture today that laws would be passed about what kind of speech could go forth in the community and that would forbid pastors from teaching certain passages in the Bible that speak simply about biblical morality. Now, if that's the case, and if the government says, well, you, you can't teach this, but it's clearly stated in the Bible, my solemn responsibility as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'll take the title preacher, my solemn responsibility is to teach the word of God and take my lumps. If I get a fine, if I get arrested, if it becomes a big controversy, I'm just supposed to take my lumps and do what God tells me to do. That was exactly the attitude of Peter and the apostles here. They went forth with great boldness. Now, look at the substance of what Peter and the apostles said. It starts here in verse 30, where they said, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I think those two beautiful verses are a wonderful, brief, concise expression of some of the truths of the gospel. I almost wonder if that's not a summary, a main point of a longer speech that Peter actually gave. It wouldn't surprise me at all. But look at the main points, if that's what it is, what we have. First of all, we have man's guilt. He says, Jesus, whom you murdered. You, you, you don't want to be charged with the guilt of Jesus' execution? No, I'm going to tell you straightforwardly, Mr. High Priest. You had a hand in it, as did many others. But you have your share of responsibility. You are a sinner, and you have your guilt before God. He touches on the idea of Jesus' death. He says there in verse 30, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. And there he's pointing to Jesus hanging on the cross, that piece of wood that was set down at Golgotha. There he is hanging on the tree. By the way, you might ask yourself, why does Peter call it a tree? Does that seem unusual to you? It's very interesting. Peter is actually drawing on an image from the Old Testament found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21 where it gives a very heavy verse there. It says, cursed is everyone who hangs from a tree. And what's the idea behind that? The idea actually is very plain. The idea is that God especially curses someone who's executed by being hanged on a tree. Now, with that idea, Peter conjures this up to make the connection to the Old Testament and saying, this is how rejected Jesus was, that he took upon him that curse from the book of Deuteronomy. So he deals with man's guilt, with Jesus' death, with Jesus' resurrection. Did you see that in verse 31? Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. Look, he, he, you murdered him by hanging him on a tree, but he didn't stay dead. He's risen from the dead. And then finally, he gives the assurance, or excuse me, the invitation for them to repent and to believe. He says there at the end of verse 31, and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I think that's a great, great, in four points, giving a succinct demonstration of the gospel. Number one, you're guilty before God. You, you have a debt of sin before God. I think about that sometimes when I use that word sin. You know, there, there are people who say that sin is a word that should be taken out of the preacher's vocabulary. Not because they necessarily don't believe in sin, but they, it's a passe word, right? P people don't use that word anymore. Think about whenever anybody uses sin in a non-religious context, they usually mean it as something good, right? Uh, they look at the hot fudge sundae and they say, oh, that's sinful, as they gobble it down. You know, they, they say the word sin doesn't connect, but you know, I... I like using that word. I think it's a word that still connects. I think that even if you have no familiarity with the Bible, if you've never heard somebody teach the Bible before, I think that when I say sin, you know what I'm talking about. You know about the fact that you've missed the mark before God. That there's an aspect of your guilt, of your falling short before God and His glory. That's an essential step in preaching the gospel. Here's another one to talk about Jesus' death on the cross. 
that Jesus died in our place as a substitutionary sacrifice. But, to the third point, it's essential that he didn't stay dead, that he rose from the dead. And that was the, the, the demonstration that God accepted his sacrifice on the cross as being payment for our salvation. But then there's our responsibility, as Peter says there very plainly at the end of verse 31, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And I tell you right now that today Jesus Christ offers you repentance and forgiveness. By the way, it's remarkable that the two of them go together there in verse 31, right? Repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness are gifts in the hand of Jesus that he invites you to receive. Do you want his forgiveness? Yes, I want his forgiveness. Then take his repentance as well. Do you want his repentance? Yes, I want to turn my life around. I want Jesus to turn my life 180 degrees. Then he'll do so, and he'll grant you forgiveness of sins. Again, I think that's a wonderful way how he gave such a faithful testimony to the foundation of the Christian faith. But then finally, he says in these two verses, and I feel maybe I've lingered here a little too long, he says here, we are witnesses to these things, and so also is his Holy Spirit. He wanted them to know that this was not just opinion, this wasn't just fables, but actually they were witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. This, this was a reliable testimony because it was based on eyewitness testimony, which was also confirmed by God. Well, boy, you can just imagine how tense it was in the council chambers, right? How the high priest must have been just dumbfounded. What would be the words from the high priest at that moment? How about this? T tell us more about this Jesus. H how about this from the high priest? T to call out among the council, can any of you confirm whether or not this man, Jesus of Nazareth, really was risen from the dead? C can we confirm this? How about saying, can, can you explain to me more? Is this fulfilling the Old Testament passages that speak to us about the Messiah? Is there any note of inquiry? Is there any note of interest from the religious establishment here? No. Look at the response in verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Isn't that remarkable? But what did Peter and the apostles do? How did they threaten them? Did, did Peter say something like this? And we Christians are going to band together and, and make an army, and we're going to overthrow the Jewish order, blah, 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 blah. Was there any threat? Was there any anger? No, there's just the bold proclamation of the message, and in response, because they had nothing else to respond with. They couldn't respond on the basis of evidence. They couldn't respond on the basis of the Old Testament. They couldn't respond on the basis of anything logical or rational. So all they could respond with was anger. It says he was furious, or they were furious. By the way, your translation may say that they were cut to the heart. The ancient Greek word can actually go either way there. It literally means to be cut to the heart, but sometimes when a person is cut to the heart, they're furious, right? Right? And so that's the idea. They were so pierced that they were angry. They were so convicted that they were angry at all this. And then it says very strikingly that they plotted to kill them. Oh, I can only imagine what went through the minds of the people at that council. Here they are looking at these 12 bold, brave apostles, and they say, who are you to tell us to repent? But hey, we don't need this forgiveness that you speak of. Or they think, don't blame us for the death of Jesus. It was Pilate's fault. Or how about this one? Do you know who we are? How dare you speak to us this way? But none of it held any water. You see the weakness of their argument by their fury and their plotting to kill them. Well, you might be asking yourself at the end of verse 33, how did the apostles get out of this one alive? How does that ever work? And that's a very logical question. Here's how they get out of it alive. Look at verse 34. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law and held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Now this man Gamaliel was one of the most famous rabbis of his generation. He's well noted in the Jewish historical writings, and he's well noted by great titles that they gave to him to honor him. And this man, Gamaliel, had a, a young protege. A man named Saul of Tarsus was actually trained under Gamaliel. Would it surprise you that Saul was there? 
By the way, can I give you one other little, uh, why I think Saul was there? Look at what it says in verse 34. It says that Gamaliel said, put the apostles out of the room and let's have a private conference. So they put the apostles out of the room and yet what follows is a fairly detailed explanation of what was said inside of the council chambers. How did the apostles know? How did Luke know what was said when the apostles were out of the room? What, do you think Peter has like a stethoscope up to the door, something like that? No, no. They're, of course, in the soundproof chamber that they would later perfect for the use of game shows and all of that. No, I don't know. I, just, I don't think it was because they heard. I think because there was a man present at those proceedings that later on told Luke exactly what happened. Saul of Tarsus was there and he told Luke just exactly how it went down. So look at Gamaliel's advice starting out verse 35. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutius arose, rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Now this advice of Gamaliel is very famous. And basically what he said was this. Guys, let's not oppose this early movement of the followers of Jesus. If it's of God, it'll succeed, and it's vain for us to fight against it. If it's of man, it'll fizzle out, and it won't come to anything. So let's just leave it alone and be tolerant of them. Now, was the advice of Gamaliel from God or not? Well, I'll give you the classic answer of a theologian. Yes and no. Let me give you the yes part. First of all, Gamaliel's call for tolerance was entirely justified. Listen, no religion, even the Christian faith, has any, belief, any business squelching thought, squelching speech, squelching what people say. That kind of tolerance is good and should be promoted in our society. And the days when the church did squelch thought and speech and writing and all that were bad days for the church, not good days. Let me tell you what we want as Christians. We don't want any special favors in our culture. What we want is we want a level playing field. You give us a loving, love it, a loving, a level, thank you for helping me with that, a level playing field, and the truth will win the day. We're happy with that. Just don't oppose us. Let us do our thing with the gospel. Don't oppose us. Give us the freedom. Give other people the freedom too. And the, the truth, the gospel, will win the day we're convinced of it. By the way, and I look at the clock, and I wonder if I should go on with this. I just say this. This is one of the terrible things about modern Islam. And, and I don't mean this to be a whole speech on Islam, and I don't understand all the intricacies of Muslim theology and this and that. But one of the things that strikes me as one of the most terrible things, and I won't say that it's a universal thing throughout all Islamic practice, but at least it's prominent in many nations that practice Islam. The fact that they won't allow the gospel of Jesus to be preached there. The fact that they have a death penalty for those who would convert against Islam. Is that a level playing field? I think not. It shows how weak and failable their religion is. It shows that the only way they can keep people in Islam is by fear and bondage. And if there was a Muslim man or woman who disagreed with me on that, I would simply say, then you should be promoting freedom of speech and freedom of faith among Muslim people more than anybody so that people can freely choose. Come now. If Islam, if the Muslim faith is a greater religion, it has a greater answer, if it has the truth, then let it hold the day without a death threat hanging over the people who would choose to leave Islam. There's no death threat over the head of people who would choose to leave Christianity. So why do you need a death threat to keep people in Islam? 
Well, Christians should never advance us. And I would tell you, there have been times in the Christian church when it has been oppressive like that, and those were dark days for Christianity, days that we gladly renounce. In any way, back to the advice of Gamaliel, not that little bunny trail that I went off on. His advice was simply this. The tolerance aspect of it was good, and he was also true when he said, if it is of God, you can't oppose it. I believe that firmly, right? If something is of God, you can't fight against it. Your arms are too short to box with God. He'll deliver that jab on your chin every time. You just can't win fighting against God. Where I believe that Gamaliel was in error is in two ways. First of all, in a human perception at least, sometimes lies prevail. Right? Success is not always the measure of truth. Sometimes there are religions, or sometimes there are movements that seem quite successful for an extended period of time, and they're not true. You can't always say that if it's of man, it'll fizzle out. Now, I think that's true in the long term, but you're talking about centuries, not necessarily even decades. But secondly, and here's where I would really, oh, I hate to say that I'd criticize a man like Gamaliel, but I'll be bold enough to do it. Gamaliel was a fence sitter. Gamaliel basically said this. Well, look, I don't want to decide against the Christians because maybe there's something there. But I don't want to decide for them because, you know, it, it doesn't seem so great. So I'll tell you what. I'll remain neutral and ask for more evidence to come in. Gamaliel, what more evidence would convince you? What more evidence? Jesus taught, and you know of his teaching. Jesus did miracles and attested his divine sonship. Jesus died on the cross and accomplished his great work there. Jesus rose from the dead, and it was confirmed by many witnesses. Jesus ascended into heaven in full view of the apostolic band. And these men, whom you stand before you on this court, this council, they are attested not only from the Old Testament, not only from the love and the joy that they preach, not only from the boldness that they have from the Spirit of God, but by very miracles, such as angels setting them free from prison. And with all of that, you say, ah, it's not enough evidence. I'll wait for more. I would just give a strong call to anybody here in this room this evening. You're undecided about Jesus Christ. You're waiting for more evidence. You don't want to reject this Christian thing outright because, you know, there's something there. I mean, if you thought there was nothing there, you probably wouldn't be here tonight anyway. But then again, you don't know if you want to embrace this Christian thing either. You really don't know if you want to be a follower of Jesus. Listen, I'm telling you, the evidence is in. You don't need more evidence. You need to decide. You need to decide now for Jesus Christ. You need to understand that to be undecided, to be a fence-sitter, is to be decided. And it's to be decided against Jesus. No, it's a heavy thing for us to say. And sometimes we use these delaying tactics. I don't have enough evidence. I'll wait for that day. No, you have the evidence. And can I say very kindly, the evidence has been in for about 2,000 years. I think you can make up your, your mind now. So put your trust in Jesus. That's, that's where I would criticize Gamaliel. All right, we better wrap it up here. Verse 40. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now, we read this text and we go, okay. They gave him a little slap on the wrist. They looked him in the eyes and said, now don't preach anymore in Jesus' name. They let him go. And the disciples said, yeehaw, we suffered shame for Jesus' name. Now we're going to go out and preach. And they did, and it was great. Except there's one thing that kind of bothers me in this. It's that little word in verse 40. Did you see that word in verse 40? Beaten. Beaten can also be translated skinned. It refers not to a little slap on the wrist. You know, they didn't get out the, the, the ruler and, you know, hit him over the head. They tied him to a post, stripped the clothing off their back, got out the whips, and delivered lashes. I don't know how many. It couldn't have been more than 39. 
It wasn't the great scourging that would happen before crucifixion. No, that could often kill a man. But it was a severe whipping. Their backs were bloodied. Their backs were filled with welts. It hurt, and it hurt bad. And the text mentions it almost as an afterthought there, doesn't it? They were beaten. It was a severe beating that they undertook. Now, the text doesn't make a big deal about it. What the text makes a big deal about is that they went out with joy and they continued preaching the gospel. Now, I think about that. I think about what it would be like if I received such a beating. If I received such a beating, that would be a really big deal to me. It didn't seem like a big deal to the apostles. To me, listen, if that happened to me, I would talk about it forever. Probably in every sermon I ever preached after that, I would make some reference to the day I got whipped on the back for Jesus Christ. To me, it would be like the biggest thing in my life. To the apostles, not a big deal. Now, why do you think it was not a big deal to them? Because it didn't hurt? Because God gave them like supernatural Holy Spirit strength and none of it hurt when they whipped them? And they just laughed and said, hit me again! Ha ha ha! No! No, I'll tell you. Their suffering seemed small because their Jesus was so big. Now, their suffering really wasn't small. It was actually a pretty big suffering. But their Jesus was so much bigger that it put it all into perspective. You guys have been following this stuff with the moon, right? What are they talking about? Super moon, right? The moon's really big right now. Wow, it's so big in the sky. The moon's big. Wow. Put it next to the sun, and how big is the moon? It's nothing, right? I mean, it's, the, it's like a pore on your skin. It's nothing compared to the sun. In the same way, your suffering can be as big as the moon, and that's pretty big. But compared to the sun, it's nothing. I think about that because uh, I, know, I know that people go through it in their daily lives. I know that people suffer. I, I know that people have all kinds of trials. They have trials of sickness. They have trials of temptation. They have trials of long endurance. They, they have trials of family conflict. They have all sorts of trials. And I don't mean to minimize your trials in the slightest way. I don't mean to look at you and say, oh, well, you're suffering, it's very small. Yeah, it's small to me because it's your suffering. But it's big to you, isn't it? No, I'm not trying to diminish your suffering. I'm just trying to say, just let Jesus be way bigger. Just let Jesus put your suffering into perspective. That's what the apostles did. And finally, just let me say one word, and I'll say it very quickly. If you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, now's the time to do it. Now's the time for you just to make a simple decision to say, Jesus, I'll yield my life to you. I want to repent. I want to ask forgiveness for my sins. I want to trust in who Jesus is and what he did for me on the cross. Uh, later on, we're going to have a prayer team up front. If you want to give your life to Jesus, you come on up and you talk to one of the people on this prayer team. Oh, yeah, you, you might be kind of embarrassed to do it, but... If that sense of embarrassment is more precious to you than Jesus, well then, you're not ready to choose Jesus. But if you want to be a follower of him, tonight's your night, now's your opportunity. Let's pray together right now. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the grace of the people in this room uh, listening as I go on and on longer than I expected to. But Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence with us. And Jesus, I, I just ask for one simple thing. It's simple, but it's not easy. I pray that you would make Jesus very big to us. That we would draw closer to him so that he would be larger in our hearts, in our minds. That Jesus would be so big to us that our sufferings, as real as they are, would seem small in comparison in comparison to the greatness and the glory and the love of Jesus. Lord, I just pray that for those who have not yet made a decision for you, that you would compel them to do so and bring more into your family. In Jesus' name.